You're listening to Parasearch Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio. Parasearch Radio, broadcasting to the UK and beyond. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Haunted Histories with your host, Penny G. Morgan, right here on Parasearch Radio. Hello, my fellow purveyors of the past and the paranormal. How are we all? I'm very well, thank you. And I'm looking forward to tonight's show focusing on commentary and looking at some of the industries intrinsic to the city. Here on Haunted Histories on Parasearch Radio. Where else would you want to be on a Wednesday night at nine o'clock? Well, last week we looked at the gunpowder mills in Waltham Abbey with some help from uh, Kent-based ghost hunt events. I really enjoyed researching in, researching into the munitionettes and I hope you enjoyed listening. When I was deciding what to talk about that was related to Coventry, the thing that stuck out the most in my mind was how much it was bombed during World War II so I hope you do not mind, but that's what I'm going to actually look at primarily. When we are joined by Dee Dee of Goth Angel Productions later, um, I'm sure she can enlighten us more to the history of Coventry and particularly the watchmaking side of things, which is one of the areas we're going to look at. And she'll be able to talk about the paranormal events that she's experienced whilst living and working in Coventry and investigating in her in her guys as a paranormal investigator. Now, as I say most weeks, we at Parasearch are always happy to talk to new people who have something to say on the subject of the paranormal, and especially in my case, if you've got an interest in the history side too. So if you think you have what it takes to be a guest, or you'd, you'd just like to have a chat with us, please do get in touch. Please do. We're all, always more than happy to hear from you, and with shows on pretty much every night of the week... There is always something for everyone, so don't be shy. Which is exactly what Dee Dee wasn't. Um, Dee Dee, who'll be my guest, actually first contacted us when we were doing the show on the Cecil Hotel way back in April. She got in touch, and we were able to talk about her experiences regarding that place. And now, she's going to be back as my guest and co-host for the rest of the show. It really is that easy, and I'm sure she'll be able to tell you it's not scary talking to me. I'm quite a nice person, really. Anyway, drop us a line, and we will get back to you. So, commentary in the 1940s. Well, we're going to be looking at the watchmaking side of things a little bit later. Um, the industry in which started to take a bit of a downturn in the late 1800s when American watches became cheaper. But the whole industrial principle still remained in Coventry 50 or so years later, which was actually the start of the Second World War. Coventry was a, an industrial city of around sort of 238 to 140,000 people and was like much of the West Midlands as being an industrial and contained metalworking industries. In Coventry's case, which we're going to be talking to Dee Dee about, these would have included things like cars, bicycles, aeroplane engines, and since the early 1900s, munitions factories. So Coventry, and I think it was a historian Frederick Taylor said this, was therefore in terms of what little law existed on the subject, a legitimate target for aerial bombing. During the First World War, the advanced state of um, machine tooling in the city and the industry of machine tooling in the city meant that pre-war production could very quickly be turned to things for war production with companies such as the Coventry Ordnance Works assuming the role as being one of the leading munition centres in the UK who I believe manufactured around 25% of all British aircraft produced during the war. 
They also manufacture a lot of the big guns that we use for the Navy and things like the um, four and a half inch howitzers, which enter service in the early 1900s. Things like five and a half inch naval guns and also a slightly bigger siege howitzer, which was used in 1914 for the British Army. They also developed the first modern autocannon in 1917. And as a company, it was a massive op operation, which was actually national, and even had a factory in Cliff, in Kent, for loading cordite into shells. That links nicely into last week's show on the gunpowder mills, if you haven't as yet had a chance to listen to that. Cliff Munitions is actually derelict now, and you do take a little bit of a risk trying to visit it as it's private land, so you have been warned. But, you know, for anyone who wants to take that risk... It is there, but just be very, very careful because it is private and you would actually be trespassing. The factory shut after the First World War during the recession and was only reopened due to the beginning of a national um, programme of rearmament in the mid-1930s. And they recommissioned the works to make actual gun mountings. So, like many of the industrial towns of the English West Midlands um, that have been industrialised during the Industrial Revolution... Many of the small and more medium-sized factories in the city were woven into the same streets as the workers' houses. And this is something we'll be touching on when we talk about the Watchmaking Museum. Everything was in the city centre, woven around the workhouses, the sh workers' houses, sorry, not workhouses, workers' houses and the shops of the city centre. However, it was also developing bigger suburbs and everything else with more private and council housing, which was set aside from the industrial buildings. So you can probably see just from this and some of the places that and things that were being manufactured in Coventry why taking out a place like this for the Germans would actually be very, very beneficial to their war effort. Now, I think now would be a very good time for us to introduce Dee Dee as her job um, working in a heritage centre in Coventry it means her history knowledge of Coventry is pretty good. And I think she's going to be able to talk through the events of 1940 with us. So you don't just have to listen to me jabber on for the next half an hour. So, hi Dee Dee. Hello. Hello, how are you? Uh, yeah, I'm all right. How are you and everybody listening? Um, sh uh, we're good, we're good. I, I almost want to good. say, I'm all right, to, to mimic your accent. I'm do sorry, I can't help it. I pick up accents <laughs> so quickly. So if I do don't say ow, don't it, take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Lancashire girl when I was born ill forever ago in 1973, so don't worry about it, it's fine. Ah, uh, well, you're the same age as me, my love, and my mother's from Lancashire, so I spent many uh, many a holiday up in Lee, staying with my grandparents and visiting places Lee. like Blackpool and everything else, so that's probably where it's coming from. My um, old dad was, was born in Lee, anyway, there we go. There you go, there you go, yeah, yes. my, mom's, my mum was born in Lee in 1946, there you go. She's a year older than me dad would have been if he'd still been alive. There you go. She may oh. even have been born in the house next door. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think she was born in a hospital. I think it was born a hospital, hospital or a maternity centre. I think she's, my gran used to mm. tell me. But I had a, my grand's uncle used to work in one of the mills in, in Lee, which is why I did a, a, a show on the mills not so long ago because it's kind of got mm. a family family link yeah. to it, I suppose you could say. But mm -hmm. it's a nice... I actually like it up there. I like it up there. Um, so we are saying about history and that mm -hmm. your knowledge of it is, is good because of your job working in a heritage center is that correct it is i actually uh for summer season for visitor season i'm a heritage assistant in uh saint mary's guild hall uh it's right next door to basically coventry's um cathedral mm -hmm. and it's in the medieval quarter and it was uh the cathedral that was unfortunately lost its roof mm. in the war mm. but yes that's where i work yeah. In a, a 777-year-old 1340s building. Wow. Which would have would that have been built then around the same time as the cathedral was actually built? Because wasn't that yeah. the 14th century? It yes, it was. Um, uh, it was actually yeah, 1300s. They were both built together around yeah. that same time. So. Yeah. Oh, I have to ask then. If you're in a building that the, that's that old, has that got mm. any sort of paranormal links to it at all? Mm -hmm. There's more than sort of, because we've got everything, <laughs> yes. Um, we, we joke with our visitors that actually seem to come into various heritage rooms and pick up on things. 
and look a little bit scared and we're like are you okay yeah is this place haunted but yeah but it's all right because our ghosties are really nice we love them they love us we all leave each other alone but sometimes we hear them we see them uh but we're fine don't worry about it it's just haunted and they're like ah <laughs> yeah I think yeah. a lot of people think that. They hear the word ghost and they automatically think demons and bad juju and, and all that kind of mm-hmm. thing. Whereas, you know, there there's more nice people in life than there are nasty people. So it would equate to the fact there's more nice ghosts in life. Out, well, well, not in life, I've if you know to, what I mean. But Yeah, I've got to say, every single one of the ghosties of St. Mary's Hall are nice. Good. We've not had, we've not had any issues whatsoever. I've seen things, I've felt things, I've definitely been touched by things, but they actually seem to either give me a back rub, a massage on my shoulders, or just, like, tickle my hair, so that's fine. (laughs) So do you know if they're male, female, age, sort of century, or...? uh, Some of them do present as... give me the feeling that they're they're male. So, to be honest, um, with a bit of a a shoulder rub, I think that's a bit flirty, but it actually feels (laughs) nice, and sometimes they'll do it just at the right time when my shoulders are stiff, so don't mind. Um, (laughs) But, I mean, we have got got a spirit of a little girl that is around 7 to 11 years old, Mm -hmm. and she's been traced to more than likely uh, being... um, uh, basically spirit or presenting as the spirit of uh, a Victorian hall keeper's daughter who mm. we did think was called Emily because she I, I had actually had an encounter with, um, let's just say a short spirit because she wasn't very big, mm. up to my waist maximum, um, mm. who I could see when I closed my eyes properly and shut out everything that my eye, my physical eyes could see because I actually see spirits better with the third eye. Yeah. Um, and then everything came clear I was in a room and I was like oh hello and she said hi I'm Emily who are you and I went I'm Dee Um, am I actually seeing this and and she went "Um, that's my daddy and she pointed to uh, a chair in the corner of the room Mm -hmm. and she said but daddy's sad because I died and so and mummy's not here anymore and I'm like oh my gosh Because with being an empath, it just hit me. And I'm like, ooh, this Mm. big wave of, first of all, shock. Because physically, I was in the room completely alone. Mm. And, of course, with my physical eyes, I I wasn't able to see Emily or anything Mm. else. I could feel the static in the room, but it Mm. wasn't too scary. It was was just, well, the room room itself is known for being quite powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, but Emily, as we thought she was called, is known for being quite mischievous, as you would expect of a child of that mm-hmm. age. But uh, we, my boss has recently researched into um, literally birth, death and marriage um, records, and he's found that a hallkeeper's daughter from that era wasn't actually called Emily. She was called um, Anne Lawrence, as she was uh, christened, baptised. Mm-hmm. Her, but her father, the hall keeper, actually called her Annie. So we don't know why. Do you know, know what's spooky? Is... The fact you just said that. All right, I've what? got my spook on right now. As you were saying, <laughs> I think her name was Emily. I was getting Annalie in my head. Oh wow! <laughs> As see, you were saying be... Emily, the the word Annalie was getting coming into my head. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, you see, that's it. We, we've said that it is weird, isn't it? The way it comes across. I mean, yeah. um, it it. I, with, with that little spirit, she's she's cheeky and she's mischievous. She loves it when we've got lots and lots of visitors because obviously yeah. there's all that new energy. Yeah. But she won't do anything where you will uh, full bodied see her. You might actually hear her giggle. You might hear her skipping across the floor as a little girl would. And we have a herringbone wood floor, mm-hmm. so you would hear it skip, 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 yeah. and like footsteps, little footsteps. But we have tables with um, information about the, the building. We also have reenactment armor. Um, but on the table with the with like the collections box, the donation box, and the info about the hall, um, we have a uh, tablecloth. But it mm-hmm. go we have it so that it goes right the way down to the floor at the front because obviously it would look horrible if we didn't. Um, and that will move like mm-hmm. there is a child underneath the table. Playing hide and, and seek. 
Yeah, literally. And of course, I have, I, I um, I'm the kind of investigator I would literally, I love it when the hall is empty because mm. it's a great hall. It's a medieval 1300s great hall. And it, it's not huge. It's not one of the biggest in the country, mm. but it's still pretty magnificent, mainly because of the the stories of the visitors. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had, we know that we've got documented virtually every King Henry. We've had Elizabeth I. We've had Mary, Queen of Scots in that hall. So you think all of the energies, all of the stories from the, the, the royals and the dignitaries through the, the hundreds of years that have passed, and I get to be paid to work in a place and walk in their footsteps. I mean, how amazing is that? The thing is, I was, but, I was uh, talking to someone about this the other week, and we were saying it doesn't always have to be. I think it was when I did the Warwick Castle show the other week, and, and we were saying it doesn't always have to be the famous dignitary that is still there. It could have been Elizabeth's lady-in-waiting. It could have been exactly. one of the foot soldiers. It could have been, yeah. you know, and... and the fact that that many people have been through so that much energy whether it's 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 like your famous people or mm -hmm. the people that most people would never know who they were but they were fundamental mm -hmm. to that famous person's existence yeah. i suppose exactly all the support so, staff yeah i mean the 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 one single night um that mary queen of scots stayed in the building uh, when really they th all of like her and her, her staff and the two earls of Huntingdon and Shrewsbury um, Elizabeth put in charge of Mary because mm -hmm. she was a naughty girl and she was a conspiracy girl and she mm -hmm. was she could very easily get um, got uh, support for herself in the Catholic faith. Um, I won't go on about that because it would take forever. Um, but um, they thought that she would be staying there for weeks because they basically they had to have her and all the staff put in St. Mary's Hall that was never made for domestic use, just because mm. they couldn't really put her anywhere else. There was nowhere big enough. Mm. Um, it was the interim. But, I mean, I get to, pardon me, I get to do uh, history tours of the building as part of my job, and I love it because mm. I can, I, I actually have, we've got certain places in the building where uh, they can be audience interactive, mm. and I will help my visitors really get the idea of the story I'm telling them about by having them, say, reenact um, uh, a prisoner that was on trial, stood in a dock in the great, in, in, off, just off to the side of the Great Hall in mm. 1915 mm. for something that they did. Um, and I can have them stand there and then I will see, I will say to them, right, now put your hands on the railings, you can see you can't push the gate forward, you could put a padlock on it, you can only open it backwards. Um there would have, you know, you look at the tiles on the floor inside the gate. Well, you can see them more worn. Put your hands on top of there. Now, somebody in the audience down there, you pretend to be the judge, and everybody else goes down down there in the great hall at the bottom of the dais. You are the jury, mm. and that way, boom, get it. You know, they understand the history. Does that ever cause and trigger that... events? Then does Pardon? does that get you? Do you use that almost? Does that have a trigger event to it? That by having people it can almost sometimes, yes. Um, I have actually, I mean, two weeks ago, I, I actually had um, a lovely young uh, group of uh, English language students who had moved here, and they actually had come round for a tour. I had them do exactly what I have just described, and the young man who I said to him, right, you can come here and be the prisoner in the dock, and I will pretend to be the prison guard, who would also stand off to the side. Mm -hmm. We actually, there is, there's a tunnel, well, not really a tunnel, it's a corridor with a big wooden door. And there's nobody behind it because you can't fit anyone behind it unless the door is shut. Now, the door was open and it opens inwards to the corridor. And we literally heard knock, knock, knock. And he looked at me and he went, oh, yeah. And I went, oh, don't worry about it. It's probably just the prison guard. And he went, what prison guard? I can't see one. You're the prison guard. And I went, oh, no, the real prison guard. We, we can't see him. He's a ghost. More than likely him. I don't know. I can't see him either. And, I, you know. I knew full well there wasn't a physical person in yeah. that corridor. Yeah. But it used to be a holding cell for the pri about six prisoners that would have been on trial and stood oh. in that dock. I was going to ask what the corridor led to, but it was it was the holding cells for the the docks. Well, for, the it court, was, it, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, down that corridor until I think it was the uh, late seventeenth, seventeen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds. There was what they called a buttery. Mm -hmm. which had nothing to do with dairy products whatsoever. It was literally where they used to keep the ale and the, the booze. 
mm-hmm. and uh, that was actually taken down uh, 17, 1800s. Um, so, of course, the end of that corridor was then blocked up, and that's when it was then used as um, other things. And then in 1915, we know for sure through recorded history mm-hmm. that the Great Hall was used as a courtroom, and that old buttery corridor was the holding cell, and the bit next to it, which is known as the Oriel window where the Lady Godiva statue is, mm-hmm. was actually the uh, the dock. Oh, wow. So. It's really interesting because the hall itself is 777 years old. So that in itself is historic. Then we've got all the other stories within it and all the energies. And we are the building. I say we. I'm not part of the building. I just work there. Um, The building itself is actually built of sandstone and ironstone, which consists of, I would say, probably hmm, 50 to 75% of each building block is actually quartz. Right. And Bailey Lane is is on top of a ley line. So one of my um co one of my colleague presenters at um at Parasage, Kerry Greenaway is a is a crystal person. So I'm sure she'll be quite interested cause mm-hmm. she 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 always listens. Uh, so I'm sure she'll be quite interested to hear hear that. I don't I think yeah. one of the well, fascinating hi things hi to hi to, hi to her for when she's listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well she's also our engineer so she'll probably listen through to this before it goes live but um yeah. I think one of the things that's interesting me most from what you're saying is I honestly never knew that Coventry had so much history because I think, you know, coming back to 1940, so much of the medieval history in Coventry was obliterated because that was the main part that got hit, wasn't it, during the Blitz? It was the medieval part. And I mean, when you've got like the period from, I think it was, wasn't it, August 1940 to October of the same year, some nearly 200 tonnes of explosives were dropped on the city leaving nearly 180 yeah, people dead actually, instantly it, it started a bit earlier than that to be honest around about april may right. time right. um because we did actually get incendiary uh damage to our great hall roof on the outer roof right. we joke and say we were singed because it didn't come all the way through and of course yeah. Incendiary is was like the forerunner to napalm. It was a yeah. sticky, luminous, horrible goo on whatever it stuck yeah. to. It, it especially the magnesium the incendiaries. Uh, I mean, exactly. I, 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 it's one of the things I, I was going to talk to you about when we talk about the the really big raid, the one in the fourteenth of November. But I think one of the things that's fascinating me about this is, and it always fascinates me when I read about events like these sort of history events, is the sheer hero, hero, heroism and bravery of some of the people involved and I found one when I was when I was looking up this I found Mm. about a chap called uh, Sandy Campbell who was a second lieutenant with the Royal Engineers Bomb Disposal you probably know this story but I think it's it's an amazing one it quite blew my mind he was in his 40s anyway I think he'd fought in World War One as well Mm -hmm. Um, and he was called to defuse a bomb that had landed near was it the Triumph engineering works or something yeah and he discovered that the bomb couldn't be diffused because it had a delayed action device yeah. so he decided to transport it to a safe place to diffuse it or to attempt to diffuse it mm-hmm. i'm not sure I'm, I'm not a bomb expert i don't know how they do it but so that he could listen to if the if the fuse started ticking he mm. lay next to the bomb the whole yeah. way so that he could warn the driver if it was to pull over and run like hell to get yeah. away and yeah. he survived and they rendered that bomb safe but yeah. then the following day he was doing a similar mission and it killed the mm-hmm. entire squad him included yeah. and I just think that's such an amazing thing to have done to have to, to want to protect people that much that you would lie next to an unexploded bomb to listen to if it ticked yeah I mean there, there is there is a feeling even now of true Coventrians that literally, I mean, they even say, if you've not been Coventried, you don't know what hardship is. Mm. Um, and it's basically true. I mean, a hero- heroic story. My my his- history boss at work, his father was one of those brave ones. Um, literally, he didn't listen to the air raid sirens. He would get his family to safety, he would put them in the shelters, and then he would, like, go he would go and watch the bombs drop. Mm-hmm. Um, 
a bit crazy, but in, thankfully he, he he survived. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to work with you know uh, Dave McGrory, who's just absolutely amazing. He's a great guy. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a, he's actually one of the coolest bosses too, pretty much. You know, <laughs> um, he's really he's, he's a friend. Um, mm-hmm. But literally, he he actually he actually told this to, this story about his dad to uh, two visitors today. Mm-hmm. He was actually saying there is a street. Um, it's pointless me telling you where it is because no one, nobody listening unless they're from Coventry would know. <laughs> um, literally, it's about forty foot wide, right. and there was a church on one side, and literally he says shops on the other. Um, and his dad uh, was um, on the church side. And uh, literally, he saw this parachute coming down. And apparently, in his words, to his sons, who obviously my boss is one of, he says, I thought it was one of the mm-hmm, Jerry's and I was going to go and try and smack him, you know, wait for him to come down, do him in. And he said, uh, but then he realized it wasn't. It was actually um, an air mine. Yes, an air mine. Mm. And of course, they would blow before they hit the floor and it would be the air wave that would literally go down and go out and obliterate everything because, of course, it was a shockwave. And he said it just, boom, it went before he could even think. And when when the dust settled and he he, he came to, he realised it had actually blown him clear 40 foot straight across the street. And, of course, the church had completely gone because, obviously, it was the closest. And he stood up and he dusted himself off and he ran across the street back to the church and he started pulling the rubble off. And uh, apparently a car was coming along the road, weaving around the rubble. He actually flagged them down. And all night they were lo- they were actually getting the survivors out the church rubble and putting them in this guy's car. Wow. And apparently it was one of these open top jobs. And with the the board runner at the side, who yeah, yeah. Dave's dad was on the on the, the runner board at the side. And they were going backwards and forwards to the Red Cross. Wow. But um, there was another time and it was a similar experience again um an air mine and uh because he was blow he, uh, dave boasts he says my dad was blown up twice and he survived mm. <laughs> but uh again similar experience where he's he's you know he's blown unconscious he wakes up he dusts himself off and basically carries on walking on on his you know to, to wherever he was because he'd just come out of the pub when it had happened and um, he said he was fine, thankfully, but he walks past a shop doorway and all there was left of a woman was from her shins down Jeez. because it had completely, it had, you know, but it's strange. Been caught it, in the blast. Exactly. And I mean, I've seen, I've seen um, uh, TV shows where they've actually, I think they called it Blitz Street and uh, the lovely Tony Robinson actually mm-hmm. did this and they were setting off, they, they actually built a 1940s uh, style uh, street, the old mm-hmm. Victorian two up, two downs, mm-hmm. and they let off different uh, magnitude bombs to see just what the damage was progressively mm-hmm. through the blitz. Um, and unfortunately, it showed the various types of bombs could literally leave a full bottle of milk untouched on a doorstep and blow your gable end away. Mm. Yep. You know, uh, and it showed if you were there and the gable end was blown away and you were under the stairs, well, that would be where you'd survive. But if you were anywhere else in the room, you'd be dead. Mm. You know, so it's it's amazing. I mean, I, I, I did. I went to a history talk recently. Or I live in Essex and Chelmsford and I, I went to this history talk on Chelmsford in the Second World War because Chelmsford had a couple of very big factories. We had Marconi's here yeah. and we also had a factory called Hoffman's, which was the leading ball bearing manufacturer oh, right. for the whole yeah. of the uk so you can uh, you know most people don't realize a bit, a bit like coventry most people don't realize how fundamental these sort of i suppose small towns small cities actually were but mm-hmm. we we chelmsford had its own not not on the par with the level i mean we're going to talk about numbers in a minute on the 14th of november what happened but not quite on a par with that but it got attacked quite heavily and the the chap who was doing who, who was doing the talk and I think I I in my forties was the youngest person there. In fact, somebody asked me if I knew I was, if I was in the right place when I sat down to listen to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but what was more interesting, the the the, the, the nice young gentleman who sat next to me had actually gone to my son's school in Chelmsford and had lived there during the World War Two because his dad was the caretaker. And so wow. he was telling me all the stories about where the shelters were at my son's school. So the next day when I took my son to school, I was like, right, there was a shelter there. He used to shelter in there in the boiler room. And, 
and my son was just like with his jaw on the floor and in, intrigued by this sort of yeah. real history anyway yeah. they was he was saying that there was this bomb it was like a rolling bomb it was almost like the bombs that the dam buster used, the bouncing bombs. Yeah. These were, were land ones that would roll yeah. before mm-hmm. they exploded. And apparently they, they, they targeted for some reason because they, they couldn't get into the factory, near to the factories by this point because of all the barrage balloons and, and anti-aircraft weapons. But mm-hmm. they were targeting as close by as possible to knock out the housing. And, and they targeted uh, where our police headquarters were. And apparently this bomb hit a house and it rolled all the way through and apparently the reports go it rolled past the the mother and her three children who yeah. were sitting eating their dinner went straight past mm. them took out the building but went straight past yeah. them and then blew up where the father was in the kitchen mm. and and you just think it, it it's it's you you just imagine there'd be like complete devastation i know there is it really is selective almost as to whether yeah. you're going to get caught up in that blast or not it's quite yeah. fascinating but talking about i think we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this one and then we'll have a quick break but mm-hmm. it, it wasn't actually until 14th of november 1940 that, that you had the the big strike in coventry was it, it when was. some yeah. four and a half thousand homes were destroyed and nearly 600 people died yeah that and night. that i mean that that was literally because it was a retaliation because um hitler threw a temper and literally threw his toys out of his pram because um, it was because basically he was he was attending the anniversary of the Nazi Party, um, in his, you know, the, the, where they initially the anniversary of when they first got going and inaugurated, so to speak, um, in Munich. And of course, overcome the RAF and bomb, 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 bomb. Because it, and he lost his temper because of course he was going to be the big man. He was there. He was going to do a big, big talk to everybody and a big, you know, be all very. Oh, I am God, so to speak. Yeah, and of course, the air raid sirens, their air raid sirens went and everybody, including him, had to go down into their bomb shelters. Yeah. Well, that incensed him because he was like, well, we can, I can kill them all I want, but how dare they fight back? And he actually said to um, his advisors, I'm not, ha- I'm not having this. I want to retaliate. Let's kill them off. Let's you know, cause a firestorm. We let bomb London. And he was advised, no. Because we've always been bombing London. Bombing's, you know, bombing London's going to do what? It's too big. All the bombs are like, they'll just disappear. It won't mm. make any difference. Um, because it's just, there's too much of London. Small let's fish, hit big Coventry. Yeah. Because, exactly. Uh, let's cause a firestorm and let them know they are not allowed to, to fight back, basically. Um, and, of course, it meant that... Um, it, it, it would really mean it because they aimed at the city centre because, of course, back then Coventry was well similar to what it is now, such a, a tight centre of community. There's yeah. not there's not a heap of community goes on in Coventry at the minute, but that's another thing. Um, uh, basically, it, it's just it, you know there's lots of buildings. It was a very built up area, and um, back in the 40s, of course, it was a community. Yeah. And um, if if they if they caused a firestorm, it would rage. And mm. literally, the, of course, the sad thing about our cathedral, because I'm sure one of the first things that you might very well have gone and thought when you started your research for this show was, okay, Coventry War Cathedral, mm. because it's known for um, the the icon of the Blitz. And the fact is the walls are still standing, the tower is still standing, therefore they didn't get us completely. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the sad things, apart from the fact that, you know, so many people died that night um, and following, and of course it lost its roof, mm-hmm. um, was the fact that on the 16th of November that year, it was scheduled that they would actually go in with teams and take out all the wooden pews, everything flammable, because they knew they were they were in the, the middle of the city. All these raids had been going on and on and on all around yeah. them. They hadn't been hit yet, but we better get all this stuff out because it's flammable. Yeah. And, of course, they planned that, but two days earlier, they got bombed. Yeah. And, of course... The, the reason is that the whole thing literally went up as much as, as fast as it did was if you imagine the it had an inner roof and an outer roof and obviously the inner roof was timber yeah uh, and um 
they, it was, if you imagine in the middle, say where the cross, the crossway would be in the building, there would be like a celestial window, but the roof, the outer roof was stepped. Right. The inner roof was kind of stepped, but more of a slope. And the celestial window on the crossway was so high that if you were on one side, you wouldn't be able to see the other. And um, uh, incendiary bombs had dropped on the, uh, the basically the end opposite the tower. Mm. Um, and I say it that way just in case anyone hearing this says, I'm going to go on Google Earth, aerial view, and I'll have a look. Um, now, uh, they were actually fighting, trying to put the fire out from that end of the roof. And they couldn't see because of the height of the, of the celestial window that... Uh, bombs had actually dropped on the just on the other side of the window. Now they could look through the celestial window, but you think it was smoky, and more than likely that could have been um, uh, stained glass, so they wouldn't mm. have been able to see much. Um, but um, a bomb, ha- a, a incendiary, had actually hit that roof, gone through, and rolled to the other end, which mm. is by the tower when people. Mm. And, of course, that had gone through. It had burnt through and dripped down onto the flammable, flammable wooden pews. And that mm. was it. It was smoldering and going up. I think what was interesting, that I mean, from a figure's point of view, is not only the fact there was sort of 4,500 homes destroyed in one night, nearly 600 mm-hmm. deaths in just one night. Um, you had something like over 500 German bombers coming in. Now, that's a mm. big, that is a big load of a a lot of airplanes very noisy airplanes as well and it but it was the the coordination of the attack that the first you had the pathfinders came in which hadn't been Mm -hmm. historically used that often then you had some coming in to drop drop explosives that knocked out the utilities and damaged the roads so that they Mm -hmm. knew then the fire brigades and emergency services couldn't get through and there'd be no water to put out the fires then yeah. they were dropping things that the, the I mean, we mentioned earlier, the air mines, that it was actually what the British called them as the air mines, to actually create mm-hmm. holes and gaps in things. And then they were coming in with the incendiary devices that were either magnesium or petroleum. Mm-hmm. So it was such a, in, I mean, just, just from a, a coordination point of view, that was phenomenally organised. And what I find even oh, yeah. more shocking is that even though Con- Coventry had anti-aircraft guns and uh, you know the reports I found the history reports I found is they fired nearly 7,000 rounds at mm-hmm. these bombers they brought one aircraft down yep. <laughs> in that many which yeah, are 500 odd aircraft to only bring one yeah. down is is astounding I think yeah. and um, I mean from what what I was told by my lovely boss at work yes I'm I'm not madly in love with him he's already married <laughs> But he's just a lovely guy. And he's, he's a really, font of information really as well. But yeah, I'll be he quizzing is. him. Yeah. Um, he basically told uh, told myself and a couple of visitors about, um, uh, a few days back last week that literally the, the, the raids, the waves of raids were coming in about every 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. You know, so those poor people, they didn't have time to gather their thoughts and, and actually go, oh, my God, what just hit me? Yeah, you know, is, have, I, is every, have I got all my limbs? Is everybody alive? Are we are we alive? Who's dead? You know, yeah. Um, and I mean, it, it was it was pure evil organized by an insane man, basically. Mm. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, if he was, if Hitler ever survived, I would love to have a word with him in a padded cell, but that's just me, you yeah. know, because he was he need he needed his head bumps testing. And throwing in a straight jacket in a padded cell because he was mm. an absolute nutter. Um, considering he was what painter and decorator, I've been told by uh, my research. The, by yeah, trades. he he, he liked he liked to think of himself as a painter, but he was a bit of a. Well, he wasn't even German, was he? He was Austrian. But yeah. right, I think I think what we'll do is we'll leave it there. We're going to have a quick thirty second break, and mm-hmm. when we come back, we'll talk about what sort of happened to Coventry subsequently. Some of the rumours that have come out recently about the Blitz. And we'll also talk about your experiences of the Watch Museum, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, we're just going to hear from our friend Harry for a minute. If, if, if anyone wants to go off and get themselves a drink, please feel free to do so. Hello. Harry Price here. Good evening. 
If there's nothing myself and everybody else enjoy here on the other side more is the sit back and relax and listen to Parasearch Radio with its paranormal news, views and reviews from across the UK and beyond. Make sure to find out more about them on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web, whatever they are, to keep up to date with all their broadcasts throughout the week. And I hope you enjoy them as much as we do over here. Hello? Is anybody there? And we're back. So I hope Hello. you've got yourselves a drink or anything else. I'm still joined by Dee Dee Mason of Goth Angel Productions, who we've been chatting. If you haven't listened, been able to listen to the first half, where have you been? Fear not. You can listen to it once we've finished actually the live show. Um, and you can listen to it as often as you like via the Spreaker page. But we were talking about the um, the, the Blitz um, in November, the one night in November that Coventry was basically, well, it wasn't even basically, it was bombarded by over 500 German bombers. Um, mm-hmm. And if you can picture how many aeroplanes 500 in the sky would be, it would probably be like a, just a cloud of black coming over. Mm-hmm. That, that many aircraft, that's a lot of aircraft. Um what amazes me though about it is that the death toll wasn't higher in that particular mm. raid, if I'm completely honest. So, you know, and, and I think what probably did irritate Hitler a bit was the fact that Coventry didn't stop, did it? Coventry no. kept going, as the British did. I mean, this was, I think, one of the things he is said to have admired and been irritated by. Um, but, but what I've been, and I'd love to know what your thoughts are on this, or if, if your colleague Dave has ever mentioned it, is that... There's one of the beliefs that, uh, let's say, the, the top people in the government and the intelligent officers had actually cracked by then the Enigma codes, um, which is a fascinating subject in its own right. And I'm sure I'll be doing something on Bletchley Park at some point in time because I find it really interesting. But mm-hmm. um, supposedly they had actually cracked them and they, they had a good idea that Coventry was going to get blasted as it did. Now, it was interesting what you were saying earlier about that Hitler was wanted to hit London really, really badly, but mm-hmm. was told, no point, small fish, big pond, you ain't going to do any damage, you're going to irritate mm-hmm. the British a little bit, but it's not going to stop the wheels yeah. rolling. Hit somewhere a bit smaller. Um, and supposedly Churchill did actually, was told that it was London that was going to be hit by this, ger- the Germans' Operation Moonlight Sonata. I'm not even going to try and pronounce the German version of that because I can't I can speak Spanish and I can speak French but German oh, I can't do that one but it translates to the Moonlight Sonata um, and a lot of conspiracy theorists think that Churchill actually chose to sacrifice Coventry to keep secret the fact that Britain had cracked the Enigma have you mm. heard of no, this? I, had, I actually had um, uh, because you and me were speaking earlier on yeah. I actually um I did have a, um, a chat with Dave at work right. today um, about it because, of course, I was questioning it as well. And mm-hmm. he said he's never actually come across any proof of that in his research. And believe me, the man, if you know, if he's when he's at home, he researches. That's yeah. it. That's his. That's his. His his, uh, his passion hobby, so mm-hmm. to speak. I can um, understand it. I <laughs> <laughs> um, and basically, he said that in his research and experience, he has never heard of that. But um, also, I know from personal experience, I actually used to live in Bletchley, about three oh. streets away, behind Bletchley Park, Bletchley mm. House, you know, the manor. Yeah. Um, I've been on the tour, um, and I know that they, it was fascinating because we actually had our tour guide was a lovely elderly gent who'd actually worked at Bletchley mm. Park, Bletchley Manor. Um, and he, he didn't work on the Enigma, but he did work on other things. And he yeah. said, I'm still not allowed to talk to you about it. Yeah. So I can just give you skirts, skirt around the subject. Mm. <clears throat> but I remember what they actually, what that, that lovely gent actually said at Bletchley was that the whole of the Enigma thing was completely and totally top secret. Mm-hmm. And he said, to a point, even Churchill didn't know about all of it. Oh, wow. And he said, because he was told what he needed to know, because also, if he didn't know it, he couldn't say it. Mm-hmm. And it was literally, mum's the word. Yeah. And don't talk about it, 
you know, don't tell anybody who doesn't need to know about it. Mm -hmm. And he said because they had some of England's top minds yeah. working on it. Yeah. Yeah. And he said it was literally, even in the, the Enigma hut, so to speak, which is literally, they've got the old, um, pardon me, what looked like the, uh, the old the uh, dial. Yeah. yeah, the wheels. Uh, the big, big computer as it was, um, they still got that in the original mm. hut where it used to be. It's never been moved. Now, I can understand why, because it's a monster. Um, <laughs> Doesn't it weigh like two tons or something ridiculous? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Um, and he said, uh, uh, I don't think they've moved it either because they actually built it inside the hut. They wouldn't be able to get it out the door. That's right, yeah. but, uh, anyway, um, I remember him actually saying that even the rest of the staff that worked on Bletchley Park were not allowed to know about the Enigma mm. project and the, Enig the Enigma was in one hut. Mm. And he said, to all intents and purposes, it would be under a, um, a cover in a box. And when they weren't in there, the, it was covered up and it looked like a typewriter. Mm. And he said, it was, it was literally, hide it in plain sight. Mm. But no yeah. one will ask because the whole thing was it was it was just majorly top secret everything yeah. was so so secret because it had to be but also if you ever visit Bletchley Park which I highly recommend mm. um they you can see even modern day as it looks now where you've got you've got council estates not far away but you know you've got a modern town not far away like 10 minutes walk away from Bletchley Bletchley house mm -hmm. uh, but you can see the old 1940s and 50s houses right next door, just outside the gate. So you can see they had to be completely quiet because otherwise, if they got word, if, if word like uh, uh, snuck out, was whispered, whatever, and leaked, it wasn't just them that would be hit. There would be the whole of Bletchley Village, as mm. it was then, yeah. would have been obliterated. And the houses that are around it, they're big houses. You know, they're like three to four bedrooms with huge gardens, lovely bay windows, all that lot. Fam Purpose-built family houses. And originally, they would have been for well-to-do families. Mm. Uh, so, you know, for me, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't want to say yes or no about the Churchill um, rumour um, because of what I learned at Bletchley Park. Mm. But... Um, well, I, I look at it that Churchill would have been given some information. Obviously, some information wouldn't came back from him, but he is—he was supposed to have been told on the day that there was going to be a big raid. Some historians say he was told it was going to be London. Some say he knew it was going to be somewhere in the Midlands. Um, and supposedly, the the Germans actually had they that supposedly they mm -hmm. did decipher with the enigmas a reference to Korn, K O R N, mm -hmm. which apparently was the German code name for Coventry. Um, oh. But they actually believed it belonged more to a radar than um, an actual. Uh, the, the, the target was going to be Coventry. I mean, talking about people like Alan Turing and everything else. When you're talking about Bletchley, it's say so we mm -hmm. can talk about that for another hour quite easily because, you know, he was a fascinating character, and uh, Bletchley yeah. is a like you say, it's a fascinating place. And even he didn't know half of what was being discovered because he had his job to mm -hmm. to work out how the Enigma worked. He didn't know the, the messages that were coming in. He didn't know what the code breakers were actually doing in the next rooms. His job was this, the, the well, the machine. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a, in that respect, yes, it was very much, this is your job, this is what you do, don't question it, which yeah. I don't know if I could have worked like that. I question everything. I couldn't. <laughs> so why am I doing this? What does this mean? What's this going to tell me? Yeah. Um, you but need, it's you need to come on an investigation with us, be our debunker. <laughs> well, yeah, you see, that's the thing where people can't understand with me. I believe in it, but I'm skeptical. I'm an investigator. I'm not a, a con unconditional. Of course, that's you know. Of course, that's a yeah. um, you know that that's the floorboards being knocked on. Well, actually, there's a there's a pipe under there. There's a hot water pipe that's flexing, which is causing the floorboards to make a noise. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm I I do I do enjoy sort of questioning things and looking into things. Sometimes I feel like a bit of a killjoy when a friend sends me a video. I go, look, look, I've captured an orb. You sure it's not dust? <laughs> you know, I do feel yeah. a bit like a, a party pooper, but you know. Yeah, but it's it's the way to do it in a factual, sensible way. Um, 
and it's a safer way because yeah. if you just accept you open your mind and you accept everything is ghost then quite honestly you're going to look like a nutter mm. and you're also probably going to land yourself in some almighty smelly stuff because sometimes something that may not be you know nice is going to come creeping up on you and before you know it you take it in mm. and it's fooled you and it's got hold of you and then you can unfortunately like as i've seen it i've I've experienced it myself mm. in the past, oppression. And then it goes to the next stage where, unfortunately, bad things can happen. And I've not actually got to the point where somebody needs to read the exorcism prayer to me, but mm. because I've actually fought off feelings, I knew what it was happening. And I just thought, okay, back off, that's it, out. Yeah. And I yeah. actually went out of the location because this thing was quick. It knew what it wanted. It had an agenda and it was going to jump on me. And I was its ride to wherever it was going. Was this in Coventry but or was it some when you were living in America for example when you were at the, lived at the Cecil? Um, that was actually at the, at the Cecil Hotel oh. and I was yeah it that was it was it's a it's a controversial building now I know because of the 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 unfortunate story of that put that poor um, yeah. Asian girl and I actually yeah. feel I, I feel for her because from when I was living there, I know full well you cannot get onto the roof of there unless you've got a key and a code. Yeah. You know, um, because I was there for quite a while living there. Um, and I obviously, because I was there for so long, I befriended the staff. And at mm. one point, one of the staff, um, a young lady, uh, <laughs> she actually told me that there was a staff washing line on the roof. And I was like, oh, okay, do you want a hand with your washing? Yeah, yeah, I do, because she'd got, like, two weeks' worth of washing. She'd been away on vacation. She'd come back. she washed it all. She couldn't take it all upstairs, you know. And I was her friend, and I said, do you want help? And I knew full well that you – I know now, because she needed a key to get out on the roof. And it was – it wasn't just where, you like, you undo the padlock and pull the bolt. It was literally a key with – um a, a number on it a, a code mm. number on it so you put your key in it was like let that fire service have for an elevator mm -hmm. in emergencies you put the key in you put your code in you well you, you put key in turn a code put a code in and that's it you're off mm. um so there's you know for me i'm like i don't know whether that young lady the asian lady that passed away eliza. i don't know whether she's, that's it eliza yeah. Lamb. i don't know whether eliza was was murdered i don't know whether it was paranormal i don't know whether she had a mental depression problem because I wasn't there. I don't. I don't know her, and I never have known her. I wasn't there myself. All I've seen is the CCTV footage from an elevator that she was in that I have been in numerous times myself, and I know has a mind of its own. Right. Which is well, even even like the fire alarms in the building go off when there's nothing to to set them off, and you know uh, the fire service responded to one once and i i actually i heard it go on off on off and i thought this is this is maybe a fire test mm. okay fine i'll go down to i'll go down the stairs and the fire service came out of the elevator and i'm thinking hang on a minute you never used an elevator in a, in a fire therefore why are the mm. fire service in the elevator i blow it i'm getting in the elevator with them safer with them aren't i plus they're all hunky so i'm getting in the <laughs> i was elevator. waiting for that <laughs> <laughs> and there were four of them and there's this little elevator, and I'm like, hi, <laughs> you're nice. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, I, you didn't just faint in front of them, so one of them had to give you mouth to mouth, did no. you? No. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I actually restrained myself. Oh, I was a good girl. I was a little bit hot when I got out, you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> when well, it's LA, no, it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. anyway. I don't know, the Cecil's an interesting one in its own right. I can't help but think there is something malevolent there with the amount of sort of negative yeah. things that have happened whether the malevolence was there before the negative things whether the malevolence has been strengthened because i mean you know somewhere that someone like richard ramirez would feel at home mm. isn't the kind of place that i'd probably want to yeah. feel at home but i think yeah like you're saying if you're sensitive and you open yourself up to things too much it can be dangerous and yeah. um i must admit for me personally i choose when i'm going to say what i'm sensing and when i'm not because mm. um sometimes i think people just don't want to hear it um yeah. going back to quickly going, going back to coventry though with mm -hmm. the whole blitz conspiracy one of the interesting points was that, that, that even if churchill had known that coventry was going to get hit that day what could he have done 
exactly. couldn't have evacuated the whole city, even if you didn't, uh, you know, you'd increase the um, uh, the air raid defense stuff around there. There would have yeah. still been devastation. So, well, out right. of interest, are there any paranormal events linked to the Blitz that are known about? Um, not that I have actually been told really? about, or wow. I think I've. Me. I've got to say, in the cathedral ruins next door to where I work, there are eerie feelings. Mm -hmm. And I try to put that down. I try to not exactly uh, dispel it, but it's a very atmospheric place. Mm. Um, And obviously, inside the cathedral, you've got all the story of what happened. And you can see how the place was before it lost its roof, before the Blitz. Mm. Um, But there are stories of... um, from there a little like we've had it in our in our hall and then it's gone back to the cathedral um of say about a four-year-old five-year-old little boy looking for his mummy and he can't mm-hmm. find her and we we've run spirit box and we've run um i ovalus and um my sb11 has literally come through with mummy and i'm like uh, i'm not your mummy you know mm-hmm. <laughs> because when you hear a little child's voice oh. at I mean I, I actually did it in the daylight and we were just quiet at work and I ran the I ran the the, the spirit um, box and I was like okay did the usual can you tell me who you are is there anyone here you know call in the spirits of, of Mary's Hall because we're haunted so I just thought right I'm going to strike up a conversation if they want to come and talk to me we'll start a conversation use this it may be easier for you to use a a radio scanner a spirit Mm -hmm. box and I literally heard mummy and I went I'm not your mummy are you looking for your mummy and it oh I literally then from the other side of the of the great hall not coming through the radio I heard the same little voice disembodied go mama ma and i'm like aha (laughs) you know okay it's not in the it's not in the radio anymore (laughs) bless him so uh, one of the things we were going to talk about was the watch museum because that's somewhere you've investigated quite a few times you say that actually got impacted in the blitz um it didn't get hit but uh one of the air mines literally did a heck of a lot of damage and you can literally see it even now and it's really quite it's quite unnerving um if you imagine it's a two it's the end of um a uh terrace of six two up two down victor well almost two up two down victorian terrace houses Mm -hmm. um that were uh watch factory workers houses that's what they were built for um and at the very end, you can see there is an almighty crack in the gable end, which, first of all, if you don't know why, you would think it's subsidence pulling one side of the building away. It's not. It's because one of the shock waves from an air mine hit it at just such an angle. Instead of blowing it apart, it ripped the building and the back of the building got pulled away from the front of the building. Now, it's not the side of the building with the stairs if it was, it probably wouldn't have damaged it the way it did. Mm. But if, um, unfortunately, it's also got to the point where now, over about the last 10 to 15 years, you the, the upper floors in the three cottages don't take weight other than like a doll. Right. Um, so you can see, I mean, you can go you, on investigations. We've gone to the top of the stairs. That's the strongest, the last strongest point. You can't literally, you cannot stand on the floors. Otherwise, you go through. Yeah. Um, and the spirits in there are um, a bit mad, a bit a bit nuts, to be honest. Um, would these have and, been watchmakers who would have lived there? Uh, yes, they would have. So, is it? Uh, is it? Am I right in thinking? I think you mentioned this to me once before when we were chatting that the watchmakers actually built these cottages. They were loaned money or something, or they were um, loaned the land. They, they were actually. Well, I've I've actually researched that again because that was a story I was told by somebody at the watch museum. Right. I've actually checked it with the trusty Dave boss at work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Oracle. And, the oracle of knowledge um and i've actually found out that the um it was they were built for the watch factory staff the the yeah. workers in in the the basically the huge back gardens of big victorian rich buildings 
But it was the, the rich building owners, the landowners and the house owners that had them built because they thought, oh, OK, uh, well, we can cash in on this. They'll pay us rent. Right. You know, and they saw they saw a niche in the market and a need. And if they hadn't have done it, then probably we would have ended up seeing um, all of those families from the, the watch factory creating a Coventry version of Boulder City. Mm-hmm. which was tents. And, of course, when they were building the Boulder Dam, they wanted houses built because the the corporation that wanted the, the Boulder Dam built in the States were quite happy for their workers and their families to live in tents yeah. and have a tent city. If if in Coventry we hadn't had, they hadn't come up with the ingenious idea of cashing in on, oh, we'll build the houses and ask rent for it, probably we would have had the same, mm. you know, a Coventry uh, tent city. Yeah. So Coventry's watch watch industry was there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And as I think I said earlier, it didn't really start to go downhill until the late 1800s when the mm-hmm. Americans started making cheaper watches with cheaper parts and all of that kind of thing. So for a good few hundred years, it was a very, very fundamental part of the city's history. Yeah. Um, what kind of spirits have you picked up in there? What kind of experiences have you picked up on there when you've been investigating the place well there's there's uh in the two end cottages where you can't go upstairs mm-hmm. um other than the top of the stairs there's mischief um, right. a little bit of mayhem and a, definitely a lot of madness mm-hmm. um where we'll get uh blinky blinky lights and we'll get um uh you'll get smells uh unfortunately you get diesel and and uh uh, stale cigar and pipe smoke really? and you get rock cabbage and it's disgusting and you know full well it's not coming from bins outside because there are no bins outside you know nothing near um and you can you can stand there even in the day i mean i've taken um lee Waite, one of our one of our crew she's also we her and me do a job share at mary's hall um And we've actually been there and we've stood there when it's been open to the public, but it's been nice and quiet. And in the very end cottage that has the crack in the wall, we have stood in the back, which would have been the little tiny dining room, Mm -hmm. knowing full well there is no human able to walk on the upper floors. Mm -hmm. And we will hear footsteps during the day. You'll hear them coming, running down the stairs, children running down the stairs. And you'll hear giggles and then uh, you'll, if you start to interact with them even through the day, you will get reactions and then you'll go cottage to cottage and it changes. And it feels, I mean, we know that there would have been about seven children living in those, that terrace of, there's actually six cottages, but there is a a nightclub at the front that um, owns the first three cottages. But then if you think about it without the pub, the, in the the six cottages that still exist, there would have been about seven kids in there. So, you know, you get, you get uh, I don't know whether it's residual or because I haven't been able to find to, to go that far and find out mm. um, just because we can't go up to the upper floors mm. um, but it's like there's a lot of mischievous kid energy and it's like you can feel them literally running around you and I would mm. say the oldest was about 13 mm-hmm. um, just because of the the feeling and the energy and the the, the height where the airflow comes to you can literally say airflow because you can feel them run past you and it's a gush yeah. of air right. but it won't it won't go any higher than about a 13 year old head height but then again you also um in the very far cottage which is linked to the other three that we can't you know that are not owned by the the museum right um there is the back cottage where there's a board up because it's not safe for you to go back there. The stairs you can't go on. They don't take weight. Therefore, they use it as a storeroom for uh, memorabilia, um, like big station clocks. They're stored back there. Now, it's only a board that goes up to waist height. So you can investigate it. And we've used laser grids and we've used uh, SLS camera and we've used uh, GoPro full spec. We've used all sorts. Um, and literally we'll point them in there and obviously I love the the, uh, the laser grid mm-hmm. because you will see in the laser grid children run down the stairs and peep around the corner and then giggle and run back up they won't come any further but there is always this really nasty 
entity that comes straight at you. And if you get too close to that board, it's like he's saying, get out my space. Really? Um, oh, yeah. Do you think it was the father um, of that family smelled. or was it the boss of the factory? Or... To be honest, I really don't know. Um, I know, I know he, he was, it, com- he comes across as, as definitely male and definitely angry, very smelly, um, quite the woman hater, to be honest, because he's, all, he's not too bad with men, but women, mm. if like with me, pardon me, I can be quite forceful, mm. were... I will stand up to that board and I mm. will literally, I will, with my senses, I'll literally imagine the force field between the two of us, like he's not yeah. getting in, but you cannot push me away. And there was a lady who I, I was actually um, an acquaintance of mine had me come in as staff because she was one crew member down. And she said to me, could you please look after this lady? She's, it's her first ever investigation. She's, in, she's um, inquisitive. She wants, she's got questions. She wants to see if she can have them answered. So I went, yeah, okay, fine. Um, and I warned the lady, don't put your hand over there. Don't force in yourself into his space mm-hmm. because it won't go well. He doesn't like it. And she was, oh, yeah, whatever, you know. Uh, she had, I think it was a Samsung phone, and she literally had it resting in the palm of her hand on the camera setting, but she didn't actually have her any fingers to anywhere near it. She wasn't taking photos herself. She wouldn't have been able to unless she'd actually, with her right index finger, pressed the, the shutter button. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, on flash, this this phone started taking photos on its own. And I used to have the same kind, same model phone. It doesn't do that. It can't do that unless you physically set it to do it with a selfie stick and a remote. Um, And I said to her, please back off because he's right up in your face and can't you smell him? Can't you sense him? And she went, I can't sense a thing. And she said, I think this is all a load of tosh. Well, it she didn't say tosh, but I'm not saying that on yeah, the radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm using my imagination, like. <laughs> oh, yeah, two words. And literally, she, all of a sudden, something hit her. I felt this energy come straight over the back half, half that waist-high board. And it hit her in her chest, and it threw her 20 foot across the room. And she started with an asper attack. And I took her outside, made her a cup of tea, had her sit down, calm down, and she explained to me what it felt like. And I said, I'm sympathetic because it's damn scary because it's your first experience. I went, but what did I tell you? Don't push it Mm. because this stuff is real. Mm. I said, you're in the dark. You're in his domain. He's not nice. I'm experienced. I've got lots of experience with this guy. Mm. we've got this understanding it's called love hate i don't love him i really hate him but he won't come near me and he won't push it because he knows full well i'll push right back Mm. because i said i'm i'm astral aware i mean i'm you know i i will say it on radio and people can hate me for it whatever i really don't care because it's my choice i'm i'm wiccan i'm an eclectic witch and i am astral aware Mm -hmm. i know my abilities I work on them and it keeps me calm. Mm -hmm. But when I have to and I'm investigating, all my senses are right there. It's as if they're my toolkit and my shield is up, so to speak, right around me. And if I haven't, if I don't, if I don't know the entity or the astral person that's coming at me or going to be with me, they're not allowed in my inner space, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I've got, I always have my, it's not so much a white light shield, but it's like a big barrier around me. It's my yeah. mental protection. And it keeps me feeling more confident. I mean, there's some places in Coventry I still want to go back to and I want to investigate. They're not my favourite place, and I'll quickly mention that one in a minute. But um, I can't wait to go back because there's more to find. Um, and there's more there's more entities there that are just like, come back and visit because we want to, we want to see who you are and then we know you yeah. want to see who we are and we want you to bring a camera so we can go, hello, mum, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> well, the thing um, is, it's a bit like people, isn't it? How many people are going to confide and show themselves who aren't aggressive like this, this entity is, who probably does show himself quite a lot, mm-hmm. not not apparition wise if you know what i mean but how he feels about things because he's a he sounds like a naturally angry sort of yeah. get away from me i don't like yeah. women you all sort of 
you know, there's only one use yeah. for you sort of thing. He, um, he will actually, that one will actually appear behind blonde women as a very tall, very wide-shouldered shadow person. Right, okay. But a lot of, I think a lot of, especially when you get to know the spirits in a building, they are more likely to show a little bit more of themselves as they get to know you and trust you. It's a, it is a, I'm, I'm not talking so much about the residual hauntings that aren't interactive yeah. i'm talking about the interactive spirits the one that yeah. the ones that are kind of you you know they're there you know they're hanging back in the corner and they're just sussing you out but mm-hmm. once they've decided that they can trust you or that you're not going to freak out or whatever it is i'm talking in my language not necessarily what theirs yeah. would be but I'm, I'm paraphrasing it they are more likely to come out the i think the aggressive ones unfortunately there aren't that many I, that mm. i've encountered anyway majorly aggressive spirits um Mm. and i think some people just but the the the, the people who don't pick up that their spirit is aggressive are the same people that probably wouldn't pick up that someone in real life was annoyed with them they'd be just like oh why are you stepping away from me i'll just step a bit closer to you why are you sort of clenching your fists and glaring at me (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's the same kind of thing it's that whole sort of well it's being uh, it's not even necessarily being empathic it's being just aware of your surroundings so yeah. we're going to have to bring this interview to a close shortly, but where's the building you'd love to go to again in Coventry? It's not actually in Coventry. Ah. It's um, it's Mansfield in Nottinghamshire, and yeah. it actually the, the key holders are friends of, of our company. Uh, they're Haunted Events UK, and they're actually... Um, the, the, the main guy who handles all the bookings is... Um, he, <laughs> He's a celebrity, um, uh, he's actually a TV host and he does various other jobs as well on TV. Lovely guy, Lee Roberts. He's actually on on uh, Twitter as Mr. Lee Roberts. A uh, really good friend of mine and um, it's the village in Mansfield. And yeah, uh, Is that the village of the damned, they call it? Is that uh, some people call it that. And I, yeah. yeah, I can thoroughly understand why. Really? I mean... Uh, if if any of the listeners actually want to see just some of the things that are in in the village, well, one thing on there, if you go onto our um, Facebook page of Goth Angel Productions and go onto yeah. the videos, um, you'll see, I think it's about six videos down, and it's actually, uh, the, the little uh, tag on it is we're, uh, something like, while we, were, while we were just reviewing footage, now, the picture is um, kind of, is UV purple, so uh, for the little uh, thumbnail for the, the video mm. have a look at that and watch it a couple of times because what i'll say is you first of all you'll see sandbags because the building is now used as a laser tag business mm-hmm. and where that happened is an old nightclub dance floor which is known as area one mm. and so the sandbags are just one of the the laser tag forts and um first of all it was lee's camera and literally she wasn't even looking at what she was doing. She was coming downstairs and she was looking at the floor with her flashlight on, with a UV flashlight to make sure she didn't fall over because mm-hmm. uh, she'd not been in that area much. And literally her camera picks up an imp, a demon. And it is literally, there was a lot of us, there was about 10 of us, and we all came down the stairs and we must have obviously been this almighty force of protected energy because mm-hmm. there were quite a few of us that were... Uh, self astral aware we got a, we, we knew our abilities and obviously we were a bit intimidated because this thing is crouching now the camera was going to pan into the left this little demon imp thing is crawling away at a crouch to the right and the look on its face is like oh no I'm getting out of here um, but you can't when you watch it first it's a little bit quick so I would say to people just watch it again um, mm. And also the other video on there is our um, is the pilot that we did in 2015, and it was in Canada, mm-hmm. in Burnaby, just outside Vancouver. We there was three of us. We set out with cameras that were just low light; they weren't that great. It was overcast, and we said, "You know what? That place is haunted. Let's see if we can make a TV video, a video of it. Let's see." We ended up for three nights. We were out there, and. It's not the best TV episode, and it's not meant to be amazing. It's actually titled Darkness is Coming, and it's what we are aiming to be able to produce more of. We want mm-hmm. to make Darkness is Coming into an actual TV series. Um, okay. And um, uh, basically, it's 
it is a little bit boo scary. Um, we did the, the things that happened there and the noises. We did not hear them. We didn't see them um, until we were reviewing our footage, and then we were, it took us about oh, a month to get through reviewing footage because there was so much going on. So what you see on that edit is only a quarter of what actually happened. Wow. Uh, and it so was that's your main thing. Your main thing now is the Goth Angel Productions. It's this program. Yeah. You're looking to develop it more. And yeah. so if anyone wants to go and look at it, they can go onto your Facebook page. The videos are on mm-hmm. there. Any sort of feedback yeah. they want to give you, they just can contact you through there. Yeah. And anything else you want to... You've got um, coming well, up? Well, if you want to follow us, we're actually... Well, well, yeah, I mean, we're actually recruiting more crew now. I interviewed okay. today, interviewed a lovely lady. So we now actually, I don't have to edit anymore. It's fabulous because she's actually going to, she's a great editor. Okay. Um, so she's actually joined our crew. We also have another young man who's, um, fortunately, he's a psychology student, but he's a self-taught videographer. Oh. And he is, so far, he's actually been freelance doing promotional videos and, of course, we are owned by um, our umbrella company, which is My Creative Films Limited, mm-hmm. and um, that is our corporate side. So, if any, if any, any uh, uh, corporate are listening to this show and they need us to, they want somebody to do a promotional film, just get in touch mm-hmm. um, uh, because uh, we can travel, not majorly far, but we can travel, and um, basically, we also are. Um, trying to be more Mm -hmm. light-hearted, produce uh, a second series, which will be Haunted Vacation Vlogs. And it's basically, if they go onto our YouTube page of Goth Angel Productions, there's a laughy jokey. We actually went for a nice day out, me and family, my cousin Cindy from Vancouver. She runs our uh, Vancouver office. Mm -hmm. And we took a camera and we went out to what is now um, owned by Burnaby City Hall. And it's an arts gallery but it used to be a victorian family home mm-hmm. um of the seppley family and it's called seppley house very haunted with mixed um spirits uh but there were various things and very strangely the little boy voice i heard earlier i i told you about i heard earlier on going mama ma in the cathedral yeah. I, is actually the same voice saying exactly the same thing is at Seppley House, and I didn't hear it at the time with my own ears, and neither did Cindy, and neither, neither did the person who was with us. But it's right there on the on the video, and I was like, so when I heard it at, the, at, at work, I was like, oh, I've heard it before. You know, I'm being followed. Oh my, I'm doomed. Wonderful. But uh, yeah, so we want to get haunted vacation vlogs going, which would okay. also be where um, it's it's where we would go out for say a day out. It's a vacation day, a day off. We would purposefully go to a known haunted location mm-hmm. and we would investigate them as a tourist and then we would put it together. So it's like a tourist information, nice holiday day off video. But you know what? We went and investigated. So if you're interested in it, come and visit this place. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. You know, but our main, thing, our main thing we want to get going is darkness is coming. And then, okay. of course, in winter, we will be doing our third site paranormal events. But okay. that's a hold at the minute. Okay, just because everybody is super well it's the summer isn't it that's wonderful so any, if anyone wants to contact dd Dee Dee, if you if you can you can come through the power the power search pages and we'll send any messages onto it or you can go onto the goth angel productions facebook page it's very easy to find it even i could find it um go and follow that have a look have a look at the videos give you your feedback thank you ever so much for your time dd Dee Dee. i've really enjoyed chatting to you i'll just what, say as well We've actually got uh, gothangelproductions.com. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Well, see, what people don't know is we've actually been chatting for a good hour and a half before we even started this interview. So, um, yeah, our ears, our ears are burning and we know quite a lot about each other. But I am sure Dee Dee yes, will be too. back at some time with her knowledge of history. And so she's been all over the, well, all, a, a lot of different places in, in America and everything else that she, she'll be able to talk to us about at another time. She'd like to come back. But thank you. I would love to come back. Oh, bless you. Now you've got your Skype set up, yeah. Um, It's been absolutely lovely. I hope everyone has enjoyed what they've been listening to. Um, Don't forget, there's Parasearch shows on every night of the week for you to listen to, and you can download them from the Spreaker page. But all that leaves me to say is have a good evening, sleep tight, 
and don't worry too much about things that go bump in the night. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.